Hi guys, I'm back with another RK PCB repair. Uh, this is yet another uh, Double Dragon Jammer board. Um, this time the board actually uh, boots up and uh, plays nicely, uh, but there's uh, actually no sound. So um, uh, in this episode we're gonna uh, cover some audio uh, issues which you might um, come across with your arcade board repairs. Um, and for this board we're going to try to uh, troubleshoot it step by step using our lab instruments um, and our schematics um, and uh, we will go through everything together and uh, try to get the sound back. Okay and on the double dragon board uh, the sound uh, section is everything uh, that you see um, on the board over here so on the on the top board on the CPU board uh, this uh, upper section, which, uh, which is separated by this um, uh, white uh, line, uh, is actually um, belonging uh, to uh, the audio circuitry. And, um, well, talking about um, audio issues on arcade boards um, is probably um, it's an interesting subject and it's well worth uh, talking about for several reasons. Firstly, it's pretty common. I think if you look uh, on eBay, there's tons of uh, used arcade boards which, um, in which uh, the description states that the game is running, but there's uh, sound issues or there's no sound at all. And um, secondly, I always uh, found um, sound repairs in the past, from my experience at least, to be a bit uh, problematic and um, m uh, probably more complicated and more difficult compared to um, repairs of um, graphical issues and um, why that is uh, the case I will uh, try to explain later in the video. Um, for now let's um, hook up the board uh, to my test setup and uh, let's see what we get. Okay I hooked up the board to my test setup um, over here. Let's fire it up and see what we get. Okay, so the game starts up, and when I coin it up, okay, we hear no sound from the coin up. Okay, let me start the game. Okay, we are getting nothing. Let's try the volume knob. Okay, if I turn it up, all I get is a, a louder hissing noise from the speaker. But no actually no actual sound. Okay, the first uh, thing I always do when I have an uh, arcade board that has no sound at all, uh, I'm checking uh, the sound amplifier circuit, which is uh, up here. This is the sound amplifier chip. Oh. And when you touch the legs on the chip, you can already hear that I can produce some hissing sound. So um, that actually tells me that the amplifier probably is doing something. It's not completely dead. Let me just check if I turn the volume knob down. If I can... Yes, I can actually control the volume of the hissing sound. So... I think... probably the amplifier is working to actually... Um, test if it's working properly the best way to go from here I think would be to um, actually put a known uh, audio signal into its uh, input and just uh, listen to um, the speakers if the signal is uh, output correctly by the amplifier Okay, so to test the audio amp, um, I've now hooked up my uh, frequency uh, generator to the um, amplifier's input. And um, uh, at the moment it's set to a, a frequency of uh, 1.2 kilohertz. And if it works, we should get a, a beeping sound um, if we turn up the volume. Okay. So, uh, 
as you can hear, the 1.2 uh, kilohertz signal is output to the speakers, so the amp should be working fine. Okay, so now that we know that the, the sound amp is working, but uh, we don't get any sound output nonetheless, we can actually conclude that there's um, there must be some uh, issue in the sound circuitry, uh, which leads uh, to uh, the uh, sound amplifier not getting any input signal, uh, obviously. Um, so the sound circuitry doesn't generate any sounds, probably. And the uh, question is, uh, what do we do next? Uh, where do we go from here? And um, the point that we've reached in this um, repair actually, I think, proved uh, to be a, a difficult one for my from my experience in past um, arcade board repairs. Having no sound at all, having checked the amplifier, having seen that it's actually working fine, it uh, probably uh, proved difficult at times. Um, to figure out uh, where to go next and uh, what parts to really look at next. And in general, I have to say that I always had the feeling that um, troubleshooting audio circuitry uh, appeared to be rather challenging compared to uh, troubleshooting, uh, for instance, video circuitry. And it wasn't until today that I actually um, thought about it really. And um, uh, it uh, uh, struck me that um, the problem is um, that there's actually two main problems with the um, with audio, and uh, the first problem is that the uh, signals um, in the audio part uh, tend to be um, intermittent compared to the video signals, for instance. Um, and what I mean by that is that if you uh, look at the video circuitry, for instance, you will have um, stuff going on um, actually all the time. So with a 15 point something kilohertz frequency, there will be lines of pixel generated all the time and there will be signals toggling uh, around everywhere and there will be activity pretty much everywhere. But the sound is intermittent. So that means that um, maybe the CPU plays a sound or starts to play a sound and then it sits there for several seconds uh, and does nothing at all and no none of the data bus lines none of the address lines or signal lines are toggling and doing much um, um, but that the problem is that this can actually be uh, that, that uh, this does not um, uh, need uh, to lead to the conclusion that there's a problem with the circuitry uh, but uh, this can be actually uh, quite a regular activity. This doesn't really point to a fault. Whereas in the video circuitry, if you find um, parts of the video circuitry that are doing nothing uh, much for a couple of seconds, um, there's probably uh, a glitch involved uh, in that. Um, so um, that's actually uh, one point. Um, if you have intermittent signals, for instance, uh, in the sound circuitry, there are very often signal lines that are actually um, high all the time and that they are that are only pulled low for less than a millisecond. For instance, if a sound uh, is supposed to start to play, and then after this millisecond where the signal is low for a very short time, it turns high again and it stays there for a, a long period of time, you will not really capture this with your logic probe because the logic probe won't show a toggling uh, signal in this case. And uh, if you have uh, really, um, you, if you need to debug uh, signal lines that are actually uh, dealing with uh, very rare events, you will um, tend to have to use the logic analyzer a lot more uh, compared to being able to use um, the logic probe if you're dealing with continuous signals. That's the first reason I came up with. And uh, uh, the second reason why audio troubleshooting is more difficult is actually because you're limited by your senses. And uh, what I mean by that is um, if you are dealing with a video signal, for instance, that ha has a certain problem, you are very uh, specifically able to tell what the problem is. You can judge the colors. You can even 
uh, in a 15 kilohertz uh, um, signal, you can even determine if there's one pixel faulty. You can see the pixel and you can uh, go from there and you can uh, try to figure out where uh, the problem has to be if this particular pixel is faulty. But for the audio, uh, you're actually really limited because uh, if you hear maybe um, an audio um, uh, output uh, that is not uh, correct and uh, that has maybe some crackling sounds or the sounds uh, sound uh, distorted or whatever you're not never probably able to really figure out in your mind or to describe where the problems lie you will never be able to say okay this frequency band uh, is limited in that way or maybe uh, half of the uh, signals uh, are missing or you won't be able to say uh, what is really going on you're very limited to maybe no sound, sound sounding funny, sound uh, crackling, uh, but that will be uh, as much as, as you will uh, be able to tell. Okay, so, but this should be enough for theory. Um, well, how do we actually go on now with our repair? And we actually do have some uh, something to go on because um, not all of the audio circuitry that we see here is actually suspect. Uh, um, uh, to be failing because if you look how the um, uh, look at how the audio circuitry actually works, I've kind of kind of come up with this uh, scheme here. You have your main uh, game CPU down here, which is connected to the sound uh, CPU. So the sound uh, circuits almost always have their own CPU on an arcade board. There's a connection through an interrupt line and um, a bus line so uh, that the main CPU can tell the sound CPU um, via the interrupt line to start to play a sound, for instance, and via the bus line uh, what sound it wants the CPU uh, to be played, that uh, wants the CPU to play. And uh, the sound CPU, which is actually a complete CPU, also needs a ROM which contains a program uh, which is uh, which it is supposed to run and um, also has uh, its own RAM access. And uh, what the sound CPU does to output the sounds uh, is actually it uh, communicates with other circuitry and this in this case and most cases uh, can be divided into uh, some FM circuitry so which is for the music so the sound CPU is uh, talking to a chip, in this case a Yaha, uh, Yahama uh, 2151 uh, FM chip. And uh, there's also uh, some circuitry for digital uh, samples. And in case of the double dragon board, there's actually two channels uh, of digital uh, signals uh, that the sound CPU is talking to. and. Um, uh, the digital, um, the data for the digital sounds is coming from extra EPROMs that are part of the sound circuitry. And then the sound data from the music chip and from the EPROMs is passed through uh, several digital to analog converters. And those are hooked up to the sound amp. This is actually how it works. And if you look at the board, um, we uh, have our main CPU right here. It is talking to the sound CPU right here. And uh, the sound CPU has a ROM chip for its program. This is this one. Uh, it has a RAM chip. That's the one over here. And um, the FM chip is this one over here. The rest uh, is all those um, uh, 74 LS parts are mostly uh, for um, the digital sound output, the sound data for the digital sounds uh, is uh, stored in those two EPROMs over here. And we have uh, digital to analog converters here. And of course the sound amplifier uh, who does the output of the signal. Okay, so how does this help us with our repair? Well, probably we won't uh, have to look at, for instance, the digital sound EPROMs or their converters or the digital sound circuitry or maybe the FM chip and the circuitry because actually none of this is working uh, but uh, I'd consider it very unlikely that all three 
paths, so to say, have failing components in them, it is very, very, very much more likely that actually there's a problem with the sound CPU or the surrounding circuitry. So we have to look at the, actually have to look at the sound CPU, have to look at the sound CPU's ROM, have to look at the sound uh, CPU's RAM, have to look at the address decoding chips, which are uh, talking to those guys over here, and we have to check if there's uh, actually uh, interrupt requests um, and uh, valid um, requests coming from the main CPU to the sound CPU. So this is the, the region that we are should, should be looking at at the moment when we have no sound at all and know that the amplifier is working. Okay, and how do we know what chips to really look at? Uh, well, um, we can see that in the um, schematics, of course. Um, as always, um, this is the uh, schematics, one of three pages of schematics for the audio uh, section of the board. This is the sound CPU um, down here, which is IC49. Um, we have uh, the RAM chip here, which is um, IC31. Uh, no, excuse me, this is IC31, the RAM chip. This is uh, actually the, the EEPROM with a, a program code uh, for um, the sound CPU. This is IC30, uh, we should look at that. And maybe um, some of the address decoding chips which are uh, IC16 over here, IC64 uh, over here, and IC, um, what is this, 79 over here, uh, which are actually outputting the, um, the chip enabled signals for all those uh, chips. And also at uh, the input lines, uh, the input, uh, the, the uh, interrupt line from the main CPU, uh, which is going to this, um, which is, uh, Going through this flip flop here, which is um, IC34, uh, and also this IC17, which is uh, taking the data bus lines from the main CPU and outputting them to the sound CPU. So those chips uh, would be uh, where we can start, actually. And um, well, these are uh, about two handful of chips compared to the um, amount of chips we have in the sound section here. That's uh, probably not much. Uh, sound uh, circuitry goes on over three pages, as I said. Um, and uh, if we check them out here, this is actually all sound circuitry for the digital channels, like channel one and channel two, some uh, dual architecture going on here. Uh, the su digital sound EEPROMs. We don't have to look at all, uh, all of this stuff. And also all the stuff that is on this page isn't really relevant at the moment because this is the output, this is the uh, sound amp here and we have um, digital to analog converters here and uh, all the sound signals are going here uh, feeding together into the input of the sound amp. So um, uh, we should uh, actually start uh, at the base uh, of the circuitry here. Okay, I realized I've talked way too much, uh, so for you guys uh, still watching, uh, let's do some real uh, hands-on troubleshooting now. Let's start with the CPU. Uh, I've put the pinout um, cheat sheet down here, and we will start maybe by looking at the clock, which uh, should be right here. Clock is pulsing, so uh, that is good. Without the clock, uh, the CPU can't be running. Next to it should be the reset signal on pin 37, clock was uh, 38. Reset seems to be high all the time, which is good. Um, and let's look at the interrupt lines. As I mentioned before, the CPU can be interrupted by the main CPU. And it, uh, by the schematics you can see that it also can receive an interrupt request from the FM uh, chip pins 3 and 4, so they are both high at the moment, so the CPU should be able to run as it wants. Uh, okay, and finally let's look at the address lines um, and data lines. Address lines are mm, on this side here. Um, so as you can see, address lines are toggling. 
so this is working fine data lines are over here um, where are we? okay there's something going on okay so address and data lines are working as well so it doesn't appear to be an obvious problem with the CPU um, on the first glance. Okay, so next let's uh, look at the program EEPROM for the sound CPU. We need to look at the address lines, the data lines, the chip enable and the output enable signals. I got another cheat sheet over here. Address lines are up here. Some data lines are here, some data lines are here. Some more address lines over here and output enable and chip enable on pins 20 and 22. <coughs> so let's take a look. Um, let's start somewhere over here. Address lines A0 through A7 seem to be all working. Okay, and we got some data lines here they seem to be toggling ok and we got the chip enable and output enable signals um, this is pin 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 this should be the chip enable that, that is toggling, that is good 21, 22 output enables toggling as well, so this EEPROM should actually be running fine. Okay, next up we got the RAM chip, which is this guy over here. This is a TMM2015, um, and I got a pinout over here. Again, we will look at the address lines, uh, the data lines, which are called I.O. lines uh, in uh, this pinout. And we also got a um, output enable and chip enable signal on pin 18 and pin 20. So let's take a look at those. Let's again start with the address lines, which should be here, for instance. Okay, they seem to be working. The data lines can be found over here doing something very good so lines 20 and 18 this is 24 23 22 21 20 so this is the output enable this is working 1918 oh okay This is interesting. This should be the line 18, the chip enable signal. So the chip enable, you know, it's flashing a bit when I touch the pin, but the chip enable actually seems to be floating. So this is a major clue. So, yeah. There's no sig no. This is connected to uh, to no valid um, signal, obviously. So we need to look at the schematics um, where the chip enabled signal for this RAM is supposed to come from, and we might have uh, already found the culprit. So let's take a look. Okay, here's the uh, RAM chip in the schematics uh, again, and uh, the chip enable, which is called chip select um, in the schematics here, pin 18 is connected to this IC over here, which is IC79, which is an LS138, uh, and this chip is used for address decoding. Uh, in the sound CPU circuit, so we need to look at the outputs um, of IC79.
Okay, so I see uh, 79 is this guy over here and he actually looks a bit crusty <laughs> but um, well the uh, chip enabled signal to the RAM should be coming from pin 15 which is here and we can see that this is floating as well mm. I have the pinout of the chip over here so uh, we are right here at the moment these outputs Y0 to um, Y7 are not tri-stated um, they should be either high or low but they should never be floating so um, I guess um, this proves that uh, this chip uh, has to be bad so I will um, unsolder this um, chip put a new one in and we'll see uh, if we get any further. Okay, so I uh, cleaned up the PCB um, a little uh, using some alcohol and um, I removed the chip, put a socket in and already put a new um, chip into the socket. Mm, I normally don't buy new TTL chips, I just use uh, chips from uh, other uh, boards that I have like um, this Atari System 1 PCB which is beyond repair. Uh, and it has many uh, good TTL parts on it and I uh, was able to get an LS138 uh, from uh, the System 1. Um, okay, so I guess let's uh, start up the game and see if, let's see if we, or rather here, if we get our sound back. Yeah, great. Okay, the music is back. That's a good sign. So let's check our digital sounds. Okay, coin up sound is working. Yeah, it looks great. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Working fine. Okay, great stuff. So, thank you for watching. Um, I hope this, uh, as always, I hope this repair uh, video helps you in some way, uh, some way with your own um, arcade repairs and maybe with uh, some uh, problematic uh, sound issues uh, that you might have to solve. Um, if you like the video, please leave a thumbs up. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, post them below the video and if you like this video and maybe my other videos uh, about arcade repair uh, you're of course um, uh, free to join my channel so again thank you very much